Some films don't seem to make much of an impression after a first watch, but you find yourself thinking about them days or even weeks after. They linger, if not haunt, drawing different conclusions each time. It's the film's superb use of minimalism and how it somehow kept the same tonal thread throughout that made it easy to somewhat dismiss Finnish director Aki Karasmaki's The Match Factory Girl. Though those very traits, I suspect, were also what made it stick around and linger in the mind long after watching it. As I seem to be on a side quest to find the most depressing film ever made, The Match Factory Girl, with its grim Kafkaesque landscape, sullen and femme-celled lead girl, and at times deafening silence, would definitely be in with a shout. After all, in Finland, tomatoes on white bread is considered to be a fucking meal. The story begins like a documentary inside said factory, where we witness, in detailed fashion, the process necessary to produce a box of matches. At the end of which, a girl's hand reaches out, checking the labels for faults. Is this girl, who we soon see, as mechanical as the machine she operates, or as disposable as the matchsticks she helps produce? Given her emotionless countenance, glum disposition, and receding chin, one would be wise to gamble on both. After work, she hops on the tram and heads home, sliding herself through a decrepit alley door into the flat she shares with her mum and stepfather. While they sit there, listlessly smoking, barely uttering as much as a grunt, the girl cooks dinner for the three of them. This is the poor girl's entire routine. After the daily grind, She's expected to cook and clean, sleep on the sofa, and cough up her entire paycheck at the end of each week. When the night beckons, she goes out in hope of finding a man. Nobody, however, ever asks her to do so much as even fucking dance. All this occurs too, without so much as a word being spoken. Instead, we hear the ongoing troubles of the world via the news, where war and catastrophe rage on, and are treated to the heartbroken lyrics of the singer at the club. Whilst almost unbearably depressing, much of the film's blocks come with a comedic twist, hypnotically drawing us in with its beat-for-beat -beat rhythmic scenes, topped off with the odd gap for releasing a disbelieving and often awkward guffaw. A little like popping a cherry on top of a rotten, maggot-infested wedding cake. Feeling as if she better buck up her ideas if she's going to snag herself a man, the girl buys herself a fancy frock to better her chances and boost her self-esteem. Seeing her need for a little pick-me-up, her stepfather finally decides to speak up and let the girl know what he really thinks of her. Water. Having been reassured by her parents, the whore, instead of returning the dress right away, gives it a test run at some sleazy, dirty dive bar and, lo and behold, attracts the attention of a dirty sleaze. They fuck. The next morning, it seems Daddy was right, as the sleaze also thought the girl was a hooker, or at least acts as if he did. The girl, however, innocent to a fault, believes this to be the start of a fruitful and blossoming relationship, and, for the first time in the film, we learn her name is Iris. That's right, the only time we learn or hear the lead girl's name is when she herself writes it down on a piece of paper and recites it out loud in narration. How fucking depressing is that? It seems like this that catch you off guard, for their emphasis is only realised once you've had time to consider all you've seen before. By this point, you've likely given up on knowing her name too, putting you in the shoes of the people surrounding her instead of Iris's, making your own voyeurism just as indifferent as theirs. What's that saying in old boy? Smile, and the world smiles with you. Weep, and you weep alone. For our femcell lead girl, Smiling only got her pumped and dumped to sample the saltiness of her lonely tears. Leaving nothing but a bitter taste in her droopy mouth. The apathy shown toward the fem cell is backed up with a title such as The Match Factory Girl 2. She really is nothing but a tool. It's a film unrelenting in its depressive outlook, depicting one of the many overlooked and completely ignored members of society whose own dreary life was written long before she was born. 
Whatever hope Iris may have had was lost straight out of the womb. It's little wonder why the movie is told mostly in silence then. For when you look around the landscape Iris is trapped in, what is there to say? Life sucks. And no one wants to talk about life's losers, even or especially when they're part of the overwhelming majority. In fact, the silence of the film says everything, for it depicts the gruelling life of the average person, and who the fuck wants to talk about that? That's right, absolutely fucking no one. Aki Karasmaki's The Match Factory Girl is a little like watching a brother's grim fairy tale on the big screen without adding any further dialogue whatsoever. Some lay claim to it being similar to The Little Match Girl by Hans Christian Andersen, but to me, it resonated closer to a modern take on Cinderella. Femcelrella, if you will. But whilst fairy tale esque The Match Factory Girl is often a deadpan, silent black comedy, with a lead girl whose face looks as if it's in the backside of a frying pan too many a once upon a time. Though behind the sadness of her inanimate mien and a lot of the scenes, a dark, twisted comedic light shines through, inviting Iris to fully embrace her own ever-looming shadow. Without giving anything else away as to the latter part of the film, I'm inclined to mention that Carrie's Mackey's first feature-length movie was an adaptation of Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, Behind Iris's eyes, a Raskolnikov dwells. Shortly after her one night stand, Iris learns she's pregnant. Why me? Could this be the very change she needed to escape a loveless life of meaningless drudgery? Of course not. Much like in Old Boy. <laughs> Getting smashed and dashed so savagely soon has Iris scouring the streets for brutal revenge. Once the world has robbed Iris of all her naivete, innocence and hope, the coldest retribution is in order. Revenge, after all, is a tomato best served on plain white bread.